being slow, but it always takes like a little we're while. Live. To load. Oh, we're live. We're live. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi, it's Katie here. Hi, I'm Jillian. All right. So today we're going to talk about everything that you've been seeing in the Facebook groups and in the WeChat groups. A lot of people are nervous and scared and, you know, kind of freaking out because we just went through this a couple of years ago um, with new changes in Chinese regulations. Yep. So uh, really quick, for those who don't know our history, I'm assuming most of you probably do. The names that I'm seeing posted down here are familiar from who's introducing yourself. But um, Katie is Katie and I have both been teaching in, in and out of the Chinese marketplace privately and with companies for years. I've been in there since 2018. And how long have you been doing it, Katie? I think I got my first Chinese student in 2014, probably. Okay, so we have both been through uh, the double reduction policy. And um, Katie, would you like to, because I know that there are a lot of new teachers here, would you like to just quickly um, explain what the double reduction policy was and what it did back in 2021? Yeah, so back in 2021, the Chinese government announced a new policy called Shuangjian, which means double reduction. Um, and it was basically aimed at the education industry, not just online education, education industry in general, to try and regulate things a bit better. There were a lot of problems. I'm not going to deny there were a lot of issues uh, with the setup of private education companies in China at the time. Um, but as a result of that, a lot of the online ESL companies, um, we're talking companies like VIP Kid, Dada ABC, Powfish, both Gina and I talked with Powfish previously, loads of those companies, the big names, a lot English, of them got shut like down. Like Wales English, that was a big one. Um, yeah. I believe they shut down literally overnight. People woke up the next morning to find their schedules emptied, students gone, no salary in the bank, um, a lot of issues there. So and that all, happened. And all the parents had their money stolen and yeah. It was a nightmare actually, it caused a lot of issues. Um, but that was for China, that was actually a very small part of these regulations that were announced in 2021. Um, but for anyone who was teaching online, that had a huge impact. I would say the Chinese online market was probably the biggest market for online teaching at the time. So a lot of online teachers lost their jobs. And we're now two years on and the, the regulations are still in place that China hasn't lifted those regulations. And they've announced several actually new sort of policies or clarifications on these regulations in the couple of years since. Um, so that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. And yeah. That's a very brief intro. I can give a little bit more detail of some of the background context as well if people are interested, but I think that gives you a rough idea of where things were at a couple of years ago. So because this happened, a lot of teachers have shifted from teaching with Chinese companies um, to either going independent or working for marketplaces like OutSchool and AllSchool or working for companies that are not in China. A lot of Chinese companies have opened up but have gone to like running their businesses out of like Singapore or Hong Kong where the regulations don't affect them and they've lowered rates and pay. So teachers are paid less with these companies where before it was not hard to find a job for $20 an hour. And I mean, now some of these companies are offering like five to $12 an hour for the exact same thing that we were doing before. So a lot of teachers are under the impression, and this is kind of a little side note, but it is important to know a lot of teachers are under the impression that it's not a lucrative form of income anymore. And that's simply not the case. If you go independent, it, it is very much so a lucrative form of income. Or if you work with a marketplace and you really know how to internally market your lessons and your classes. And it's just really, really important to understand that when you own your own business, because this is what this is. I'm, somebody, somebody commented in a Facebook post, um, I know you remember this, Katie, something about, um, uh, not at this, you're not cut out. Not all online teachers are cut out to like be business owners. But at the end of the day, whether you're working for a marketplace or you're working for yourself and you're doing your own classes independently, that is what you are. You are a business person. You own your business, whether you're an independent contractor or, or completely on your own. And because of that, you have to think like you're a business owner. Things are going to change. When you own your own business, I don't care if you are um, selling shoes at Foot Locker and you've got your own Foot Locker kind of store, or you're teaching online, or you know you, you've got some sort of service anywhere that you that you maybe, maybe you're a psychiatrist and you have your own clinic, right? 
things are going to change. Regulations are going to change no matter where you are, where you're from, what you're doing. And now you're putting two very uh, quickly developing things together. You're putting education and technology together. Those are always developing and always changing, always evolving. So when you are in this type of business, you have to be prepared for changes. Now you're going to add to it. If you're teaching in the Chinese marketplace, things are going to change because they like to change things, right? They like to have, um, they like to, to put a lot of policies in, policies in place so that they can keep their government and their country running the way that they feel works for them and that they want it to, to be. So I think this is also not just exclusive to China. Sorry, interrupting. Right, like, right. All not. countries around the world have regulations, right? For example, here in the UK where I live, um, there were regulations that came out a few years ago that were aimed at, I think it was to do with like Uber and those kind of companies that were employing people on a sort of freelance type basis that then had a knock on impact on online tutoring companies because of the way that they hired the contracts they had with their tutors. Um, and that affects the online in teaching industry just as much as it affected Uber drivers. Um, and I think it's the same in, I want to say California in America. I'm not an expert in and New York. Side. So I live in New York. Yeah. Um, I actually had a teacher ask me yesterday. They're like, oh, I'm getting a lot of, uh, people are getting a lot of bookings on VIP Kid. Are you with VIP Kid? I'm like, I'm in New York. They changed policies a couple of years ago. Federally, they were trying to change policies a couple of years ago. And if you scroll way back on my on my YouTube videos in, in here, you'll see um, you'll see the an actual VIP kid teacher went up there and talked to um, the senators or Congress or whoever. I, I don't really like politics, but um, whoever it was that they were talking to. And uh, they were like, well, what happens if you fall out of your chair at work? Like, who's going to cover you? And she's like, it's my house. I need to keep my house clean. But things are always going to change and you have to be prepared for those changes. The one really good thing, and I'm just, I'm going to preface everything that we say here. Okay. Everything that we say here is going to be prefaced by if you do not rely on a company and you learn marketing skills, you learn how to market your business, you learn how to enroll your own students, you learn how to make content and just run everything on your own. And you're not relying on a company to give you the students and give you the hours and give you the pay. Then it doesn't matter what happens anywhere because you can take the skills that you learned and that you were using for your Chinese marketplace, say tomorrow. China is put under a bubble, okay? Like from one of those movies, right? Like a big dome, right? And nothing can get in, nothing can get out. Completely cut off from the world. That's obviously never going to happen. Worst case scenario, movie style scenario, right? And China's not accessible. They're like off the map for you. What are you going to do? You're going to take those skills that you learned and you're going to apply them to a different market. You're going to do the exact same thing that you did for Chinese students and you're going to do it for students somewhere else. My niche, my um, I hate the word niche because it's it's uh, overused and, and watered down now and people don't understand it anymore. But the people that I teach generally, that are people that I market to, it's not in China. I don't even teach in China for the most part. Yes, I have Chinese students, but the majority of my students are American uh, students who don't speak any other language but English. So like you, you don't even have to just teach ESL. You can be a math tutor. You can be a technology tutor. You can be a science tutor. You can, um, you know, you can teach like Katie and I both teach teachers how to teach now. There's a million different things that you can do. You're not like pigeonholed into one thing just because you stop there. Yeah, and I'll just, just say quickly though, don't panic. <laughs> For anyone's tuning in right now and hearing us talking about pivoting and giving up on China, China is not in that kind of situation right now um, in terms of this bubble idea. I was actually messaging a teacher earlier today who was talking, making a comparison between like, China and North Korea and the way they regulate the internet, very, very different. Obviously, I don't think any teachers are, are teaching North Korean students here um, because their internet is completely locked down, right? I highly doubt China is going to go in that direction. And as we're going to talk about today, I'm going to screen share and show you the regulations, show you the official announcement from the Ministry of Education. And you'll see this is not what they're trying to do. Um, so we'll learn more about that um, in a moment. But yes, I'm just having a look at the chat. The chat's going wild. So thank you, everyone, for messaging in the chat. We've got lots of introductions. I can't go through all of them, but thank you, everyone, for saying hi and tuning in. It's great to see teachers from all around the world joining in today. Lots of familiar faces. Um, Thank you, Brenda, saying nice haircut. Thank you. I got a haircut. It was it was too long. It was getting ridiculous. Um, there's a few questions and things, but we might get back to those later on as we go through, because I think a lot of these will answer 
as we go along. Um, but if you've got any questions at any time, just pop them in the chat. I'm just starring them. We'll come back to them um, at a relevant point as we go along. And this is currently being streamed on in three different places. So it's being streamed in the online ESL teacher, teacher success and support group on Facebook, on Katie's YouTube channel and on my YouTube channel. So if you are not in the Facebook group or following both of those channels, and this is something that you're interested in, you're an online teacher and make sure that you're all three places because Katie and I generally, generally talk about different things, but they both relate to online teaching. And that Facebook group has almost 40,000 members in it. It right now and it's a great place to be and learn different things in regards to teaching online fantastic yeah absolutely do follow us both i put the links in the description on uh, if you're watching on my channel it's in the description i think jillian did the same on her account but you should find links underneath or if you just search for jillian shanahan or katie prescott you'll find us on youtube um anyways cool um shall we jump in i want to just actually before we jump in officially i want to just give a quick disclaimer because we're talking about legal things here and, and legal stuff i just want to quick disclaim both me and jillian are not legal professionals nothing we're saying is like official legal advice we're just online teachers like you we provide you know insights into the online education industry and things for teachers but we're not legal experts okay our goal is just to share and educate um each other you know with details of things that are coming out nothing official anything we say is just our own opinion and it, ultimately as a business owner it is your responsibility to check any regulations um, and consult with a legal professional before you make any decisions. Okay, so <laughs> disclaimer aside, um, hopefully nothing to panic about today. Um, but I just want to make that clear that you know this is not a official legal advice kind of webinar. This is just sharing the official update from the Ministry of Education for you to make your own interpretation um, from that. Okay, we've got someone in the comments saying, "Can you please get to the point?" <laughs> this is nerve wracking. Okay, <laughs> should we get on with it? Um, I have here the screen share. Okay, can we all see that? Okay, let me know in the chat that this is all working. Um, so I've got here, oh, it was a bit weird size. Can I make that bigger? Let's just make that a bit bigger because it's kind of weird to see, hard to see. Okay, I can't make it bigger. I can. I think it can be seen fine. Can you see, okay. I can Hopefully see Hopefully that's all right. Great. Um, sorry if it's a bit small. I'll read out the key points anyway, um, but this is, this is what my computer screen shares. I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, this is an announcement by the Ministry of Education of the People's Republic of China. So this is the government, um, Kind of ministry of education that is responsible for all education related things in china and they make announcements all the time on a whole broad range of different stuff to do with education and schools right um, this particular announcement came out on the 23rd of august 2023 so 23rd of august 2023 this was announced it actually comes into effect on the 15th of october in 2023 they have to give people notice you know before they implement any new regulations Companies have to be given a bit of notice to be able to check that they comply with the regulations, things like that. Um, so yeah, this still doesn't come into play if you're watching live. This doesn't come into play for another month, but um, this is you know giving everyone an update uh, so they can be prepared. And it's very long, and I'm not going to read the whole thing for you. It's actually originally in Chinese. I've just used Google Translate to translate this for you. Oh, what is my computer doing? There we go. Okay, um, I was saying I had it. It's in Chinese. I just put it into the Google Translate thing to convert it into English. But if you want the original Chinese, it's on the Ministry of Education website. Obviously, the official Chinese version is the one that, um, you know, is the one we should be following. But anyway, there's a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> but if we scroll down, I'm going to pick out some of the key points. First point here, um, it's talking, this is mostly re reinforcing stuff we are told previously. So the majority of this is what we already knew from the 2021 announcements and some of the regulations and the kind of clarifications that came out after that. There's not a huge amount that's actually new, um, but we're going to talk through some of the key points and those new things um, today. So first thing I've got here highlighted, uh, article number two. It's talking about preschool children, primary and secondary school students over three years old. This was always the case. These regulations only apply if you're teaching students who are like at a school age, they're attending compulsory education. So you're teaching business English. Sorry, ignore my phone in the background. Um, if you're teaching business English, none of this matters to you, right? You're teaching adults. This has never applied to you anyway, always from the beginning. So don't need to panic. I'm if sorry, is 1990 kids, calling? Is that a house phone? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Do you not have these phone ringtones in America? <laughs> this is admittedly quite an old phone. <laughs> Hopefully it stops ringing. I think it's my granddad phone and he calls every now and then to chat for like three hours. Okay, it stopped. Okay, sorry. <laughs> It's, it's a very traditional ringtone, you know, you recognize it. It's, it's, 
loud. <laughs> okay. So these Good. are the regulations when they say yes. in accordance or in, in accordance to or the law, like in violation yes. of the law. This is where they're talking about no classes after 9 p.m. Yes. There was a whole bunch of regulations. And it's like, I think you pointed out, it'll be massive. You know, it's not just this one particular document. So they just refer to other regulations that you should also be aware of. Like there was a rule about no classes after 9 p.m. It's not actually just classes. There's also no online gaming, no social media, nothing for kids like screen time wise after 9 p.m. And, and they they limited the amount of social of social media and gaming too to so yeah. many hours a week. But the one the the one that affects you the most, that affects online teachers the most is no classes after 9 p.m., which is, is pretty reasonable. The reason they made this is because kids were being overworked and overstudied and they mm -hmm. had a huge like mental health problem with their youth. So they needed to change this. So absolutely. Like ultimately the goal of these regulations was not to try and get a whole bunch of online teachers fired. They didn't they had, they had nothing against online teachers directly. Their concern was about kids and the pressure being put on kids and parents to pay for the kids' private education and stuff because of the amount of yeah, it was very intense. Um I'm not sure if many people here have actually been to China or taught in China before, but um if you're at all familiar with how the Chinese education system works, you might be aware of these things called training centers. Um, and training centers are like in-person kind of cram schools. I think in other countries they're often referred to as cram schools, after school education programs for kids to learn intensively a whole range of subjects, math, science, Chinese, English, even art and stuff. They would have intensive classes to get the very best grades in those subjects. And they were expensive. There were a lot of pressure on kids. They were trying to push them well above their grade level beyond what they should be doing. And yeah, it was causing problems. So this is why the government announced this thing on the screen here, um, basically, targeting any company that targets kids in compulsory education these regulations apply to so Jadine wanted to know how they monitor that they can't monitor that for private teachers um, that was a regulation that came out um, before the double reduction actually and um, like maybe six months six to nine months before double reduction came into effect they changed this and it changed how all the companies have to do things so uh, uh, it's kind of it's kind of like common sense though. Like you don't want your kids if, if they have to go to school, you don't want your kids up at nine o'clock. Take I, I don't want my kids up at nine o'clock at all. Like you're you're in bed at seven o'clock. The little ones like <laughs> goodbye. Um, the thing is that the government tried to the government trying to try to do various like less intensive measures to try and reduce the amount of pressure being put on kids. And they've been trying to do that for years before the double reduction policy came out. Like no classes after nine p.m. Like um, tutoring centers couldn't sell class packages that were more than three months in duration or more than 60 class hours. They put in regulations like that just to try and reduce some of the pressure being put on kids and the financial pressures on parents, but it wasn't working. And that's why they had to take things to a higher level and implement these stricter regulations. And that's why I think came about. Okay, said, I'm rambling. It, yeah, English, English for all over said, isn't it true teachers should not be outside of China? Um, this might be touched on a little bit later. In a minute, minute, yeah. but, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I want to address that actually in a moment when we put the actual official bit on the, the on that in the regulations because okay. um, this is actually quite an interesting one, which I think I'm going to do next. Let me scroll down. Where did I hide it in the next bit? Um, there's a whole list of other stuff on these regulations. Again, you can read these at your own leisure, talking about exactly what kind of punishments and who is responsible for what and all this stuff. Um, but what is most relevant to online teachers is if we scroll down as far as Article 9. This is on the section on jurisdiction. So who does this law apply to um, and who should take responsibility for um, enforcing the law, right? Because in China, I think, I don't know much about America, but I think it's a similar idea to America where you have states that enforce stuff and then you have stuff at a government level, right? I, the UK is a bit simpler, perhaps, <laughs> in terms of these things. But in China, you know, regulations can be forced at a local level. They can be enforced at the level of the whole province or they can be enforced at a national level right depending on the severity and where things are taking place so there's a whole series of sections in these regulations that addresses that who is responsible for actually checking and enforcing these regulations most of it is all about in-person programs i mentioned this a little bit earlier and about the problem of in-person tutoring centers these cram schools in china being a major issue and that's, to be honest, the main focus of these regulations. So articles, I think, three or something through to eight, these ones are all talking about in-person programs from, sorry, six. All of this section is about in-person programs. That's their main focus. 
It's only when we get to Article 9, it starts mentioning online off-campus training activity. They call off-campus training activity just means outside of school education program. Um, and it says specifically, administrative, ugh, words. administrative penalties for online off-campus training activities without approval. That means you haven't got prior approval from the Chinese government to do stuff. Like you're not a registered business in China, for example. Shall be under the jurisdiction of the off-campus training competent department of the provincial people's government where the illegal subject is located jurisdiction. Some of that is a bit confusing and uh, probably not helped if it was Google translated. But essentially what it's saying here is that depending on where the teacher is located is the that is the location that's responsible for enforcing the regulation so it says here the illegal subject is located so by subject they mean the person doing the action a bit like we're all english teachers here mostly mostly english teachers here right subject and object in a sentence subject is the person doing the action object is the one receiving the action right um so, and it's the same with Lee, I Googled it, apparently the, the legal definition of illegal subject is a person doing the action, in this case, the online teaching. So it, my interpretation of this, again, this is not official legal advice, but from what I can tell from this, if you're a teacher in China, let's say you live in Shanghai, and you're teaching a student in Beijing online, then it's responsibility of the Shanghai government to enforce these regulations and to punish you for breaking the law. If you're not located in China, you're located in New York and your student is in Beijing, then according to what it says here, it's the responsibility of New York to enforce these regulations. But these regulations don't even apply in America. This is Chinese regulations. I think this is where we hit the issue of what is the legal jurisdiction? Like who, if you're outside of China, do you have to follow the Chinese laws? And it's interesting they haven't really made any, they haven't really made any direct mention of online teachers, any provision for the situation of a teacher who is outside of China. They've only reconsidered the situation of businesses and independent teachers who are located within China. Um, and if you want to, which is interesting to look, at. look at this. Now you have to keep in mind that when things are translated from Chinese to English, that it doesn't always translate 100%. But if you look at this on the line above what she has highlighted here, it says, off-campus training institutions. You, as an independent online teacher, you are a person, you are not an institution. So this should not even apply to you. That's the thing. So it talks about later about their definition of an institution, like an organization, what, how do they define an organization? And that's actually a separate thing again, entirely. Um, but the firstly, does, uh, does the jurisdiction apply? Is it, are we under the laws of China in this case, or are we under the laws of the country that you're residing in? And according to what it says here on the screen, it appears that you'll be under the laws of the country you reside in, which, is, which makes sense, right, from a logical point of view. Um, and also from China's point of view, how could they even enforce policies anyway with countries like outside of China, uh, particularly when it comes to individual teachers? And it's interesting to note that like we've seen foreign companies, I'm talking like Cambly, for example, or some of the Chinese companies that just re-registered themselves abroad um, into, you know, Singapore or Hong Kong or America, or whatever, they are still advertising on Chinese social media. They are still recruiting Chinese students. Um, they're located outside of China. Okay, I think I've rambled on about this point enough, but hopefully this answered a few people's questions about, um, like, if you're an online teacher outside of China, does this apply? Um, short answer appears to be no, but again, this is your legal responsibility to check because there might be some variations in this. For example, if you have a registered business entity in China, you'd be in a different kind of situation there. Um, and if you are in China, then these laws very much apply to you. Like if you're a tutor located within mainland China, stop tutoring Chinese kids. Okay, <laughs> like very different situation there. But I think most of us here, particularly if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, which are obviously blocked in China, you're probably not in China. And I'll tell you, Daniel, um, who, I don't know if everybody knows who Daniel is. He used to be with VIP Kid or used to help, I'm sorry, he used to help teachers that were with VIP Kid. Um, he teaches privately um, inside of China. And he said that he's not worried, that he doesn't even think it's going to affect him. So the teachers, the, the teachers that are actually Chinese that are teaching inside China and they're teaching, they're privately tutoring students independently and they live in China they are not concerned about this just to give you like an idea of how concerned you should be yeah i think as we read through some more details on the regulations you'll see they're very much focusing on organizations they're still trying to crack down on particularly in-person 
private tutoring centers. If you walk down the street in China, probably not so much today, but like three, three or so years ago, before the regulations came out, probably before COVID as well, because that shut down a lot of stuff. But say 2019, you wandered through the streets in China. I was in China summer 2019, in fact. And I can remember seeing lots of these private education, English centers, also maths, Chinese studies, um, English, science, all of these subjects, tutoring centers in China, they were everywhere. Um, that's what their focus was on. And there's big international and national level kind of companies operating that area. There's also some really small local ones. I think that's what they're trying to narrow down on at the moment. And some of these, for those of you who don't know what a cram school is, if you ever talk to, if you ever have a student that's in a, in a cram school, it is ridiculous. Sometimes they have like basically dorms where they can live there or sleep there because they don't have time to go home. They will start at like six, seven o'clock in the morning. They'll start their, their, their education and they won't get back until like eight o'clock at night. And I had a student that would come in for classes. I think her classes were at nine o'clock and, um, she would log into her classes and be like falling asleep at the computer and yeah. like, uh, you know, or, or, or sitting there trying to do their homework, like in the middle of class, because not only were they there from like 12, 13 hours of their day, but then they'd get sent home with homework and then have to go to their tennis practice or their badminton practice or their ping pong practice and their English classes and everything else. And it, it was, it's a lot to put on a kid. And you're talking, the kids that I teach are usually like nine years old. So imagine putting your nine-year-old through all of that. So there's a reason that they did all of this. Yeah, I can remember when I was living in China, um, I had a little side income doing a bit of tutoring here and there as well. And uh, one of the kids I was, I say tutoring, I, went, I was more babysitting, providing an immersive English environment. I don't want to call it. I was overpaid for babysitting, I think. Um, <laughs> but she was three years old. Um, she could barely speak Chinese. She was, still, she was learning Chinese along with me, to be honest. Like <laughs> She was teaching me Chinese. I was teaching her English was kind of the vibe we're going on there. And But her parents were paying for her to have English classes with me for a couple of hours every weekend. Um, and on top of that, like often we'd pick her up from her English cram school. This would be like Saturday morning. We'd first drive to her English cram school and pick her up where she'd been since like seven in the morning, taking intensive classes for a couple of hours. Then we'd drive back to their place and then I would be teaching her supposedly intensive classes. We had more fun than anything else, but um, I'd be teaching for a couple of hours. And then she had more things. I think there were more sports or uh, art related type things in the afternoon. Like she had a full schedule of stuff that she was doing. And this was the age of three years old. So this is why China implemented these regulations. We said it before, but I'm saying it again, but it's, there was a reason for it. And I think we can understand as teachers that we don't want kids to be under too much pressure. And this is why this all came about. Um, I see a comment here that I want to address really quick. Mm -hmm. Someone said that they made a WeChat post um, surveying them to get their opinion on this matter. You, that's fine. That's fine if you do that. But I do want to warn you, don't take what they say as word. Because what happens is these parents get, and I've seen this happen so many times, and it ended up being like nothing happened. But the parents will get together and they have like, just like you're having your own massive panic over here on Facebook, they have the same thing going on on WeChat. And what they're saying is not anything having to do with the law. Um, they don't understand the politics anymore. Most of the time anymore that we understand the politics in America. Like, I mean, it's, it's kind of like that, right? Like you have, you're getting an opinion on a political matter and a lot of them uh, get scared because they don't understand what's happening. They don't know what's happening. It's not like the government is like, like very clear on how it's going to affect them because again this isn't meant to target online teaching so just be really careful when you start talking to people um you could potentially start a panic there where there wasn't one yeah i think ultimately um it's important to take perspective and to most of these regulations i think we looked at so far it's just reinstating what we already knew this is the same as what was announced in 2021 so far there's a few minor things i'm going to point out as we go through but most of this is no major change. Um, there's not, this is not a big crackdown on online teaching. Uh, they're not going after independent online teachers who are located outside of China. This is not their goal. Um, so yeah, no need to stir up panic. Um, but let's have a look at the regulations. Let's properly understand them because you know, that is your responsibility as a business owner to do that. I'm gonna scroll down a bit. I know there's some more questions in the comments, but these are about to be addressed. So I'm just gonna scroll down to the next section I'd highlighted. Um, one key thing I picked out here was that they're also particularly targeting teachers who are school teachers. This was another one of the regulations that came out before Shuangjian, before the double reduction policy. They banned in-person classroom teachers in China from having 
side jobs doing tutoring at home and that was all to do with like student favoritism and um reducing the pressures on kids again what you don't want to have is your kid going to school and then your school teacher saying to you as a parent oh i think your kid needs extra help sign up for my classes they're only 20 dollars an hour and i'll give your kid extra tutoring and give them extra help in school as well so the government was worried about that kind of stuff and it was going on um so they banned classroom teachers from doing any kind of out of school tutoring that was banned years ago um i'm going to say like five years back or more um, so that's if you see anything talking about teachers, they're talking about teachers in China with a Chinese teaching license. Okay, scroll down a bit more. Okay, this is when we start getting to the bit that is specifically about um, defining an organization. So it talks here about um, an unauthorized off campus training institution and how that's defined. Now, an authorized one is one that's been given permission, right? If they've been given permission to do online training, then no worries, they've, they've got the right permissions in place. That basically applied to a few not-for-profit organizations and government-run organizations. There were some exceptions and whatever. Um, but unauthorized means you haven't got official authorization from the government, you're not registered in China, and you haven't had permission, right? Um, how is this defined? So to call it an organization, they're saying that an organization has some kind of special training venue um, or a website for the online training or an app. So you've got a place where the tutoring is taking place. You've got to have at least two training practitioners. That means at least two teachers. And there's some corresponding organizational structure and division of labor. So some kind of admin arrangement, right? Someone who's the manager, someone who's the teacher, someone who's fin doing finances, something like that. Some kind of organizational structure. It doesn't have to be registered business. And they're trying to crack down, I think, here on some of the kind of micro agencies and stuff that popped up whereby maybe not at a really tiny level, but some of the ones who used to run cram schools, they then went kind of underground, closed their cram school business registration, canceled that, shut down their business, but then they still had the parent contacts and they still had the teachers who used to work for their cram school. And then they independently basically continued running the cram school, but not as a registered organization. That seems to be who they're targeting with these, but it could also apply to online and offline organizations. I don't know if that made sense. Have I just rambled too much? Have I overwhelmed everyone with details? It's on the screen. Have a read as we go. Um, let's have a look in the chat. Uh, I've got a question here. Actually, this is not mentioned in these regulations. This is a different regulation. Um, under the rules, it's illegal for parents to use teachers outside of China. OK, this is not in these regulations. This refers to, again, one of the policies that was announced before summer 2021 to try and reduce um, issues uh, with the education regulations and things and they said basically companies couldn't recruit teachers outside of china unless certain conditions and things were met this was also before that there were also requirements such as teachers having to have a degree and having to have a tefl certificate um they had to have some kind of qualifications to teach they started implementing those kind of regulations uh, way back um, and this was one of the things that came under that basically you could still hire overseas teachers in certain situations, but what you couldn't have is a company hiring random people from America to teach online um, without them having a teaching license of some kind, such as a TEFL certificate. Um, that was about companies. It was not about parents. I have not got those regulations on the screen. Please look them up yourself and do your own research or your proper, um, you know, that's your, your responsibility to check the regulations and the legal side of things. But from what I remember, this was about companies, not about parents. Did you know anything about that, Gillian? The, the yeah, that, were, about, what is the power that happened the in December of 2019 is when the TEFL uh, thing came into place. TEFL and TESL thing came into place what, December 2019, I think. Um, 2018, 2019. One of the two. Okay, I'm, it was a long time ago. It was it was it was it was December. It was it was December that everybody had to get them. Um, and I was working for Palefish when the Tefl and Tesla came into, into effect. The um, with the double reduction policy, they actually the one that came out in July of 2021. That is where they said that teachers um, by companies that were authorized by the Chinese government, um, the teachers had to be from China. So that was when you saw a lot of companies like palefish ended up going to singapore but before palefish went to singapore you saw them hiring a lot of chinese teachers instead of teachers from other countries because that was the way they were intending to pivot and then they realized that the people wanted the foreign teachers but um 
that's when you saw a lot of these companies start um, recruiting Chinese teachers because they were going to try to do it that way. The Chinese government wanted their teachers to to remain in China and not be foreign. Um, Part of that was down to the ability to regulate things. Like when you have a bunch of teachers that are overseas, they can't easily verify qualifications. They can't easily do police record checks. Um, they can't enforce policies so easily. Whereas when you've got teachers who are inside of China, you know, the government can make sure that these teachers meet all the requirements to be teachers, right? They're legit people, not some, you know, scary pedophile who wants to go online, all kinds of awful things. You hear some crazy stories about some of the online teaching companies and things that happened. Um, not to go into details, but yeah. Okay. So that was a little bit then. So they, they here they're focusing in on organizations and how they define an organization. It doesn't have to be a registered business. It just has to be something that looks organized with multiple teachers. Um, it then goes on in Article 18, which you can just see um, on the bottom of the screen here. Article 18 is talking about a natural person, legal person, or organization. Natural person means an individual person, not just an organization. Legal person could be a person or organization. It's the one who's legally responsible or other organization. Conducts off-campus training in a disguised form. And it gives more details what they define by a disguised form. But again, this gives you an indication of what they're actually trying to focus on um, rather than online teachers. So they're talking here about people who continue to run these cram schools, these in-person training centers, but called it something else instead. Um, and as we scroll down, there's a bit more here. And they're counting that this is how serious it is, depends on various factors. And it has a list here of what kind of things are included. Now, of note, it does include instant messaging, online conferencing, live broadcast platforms, etc. This is basically the only direct mention of things that are relevant to online teachers in these regulations. The rest of it, very vague or very specific to organizations in China doing in-person tutoring. This is the only time it's really directly mentions online teaching in this context in terms of who it applies to. Um, and then it also mentions various other things. In particular, I want to see point three here. This I know was a major issue for the government when they implemented the regulations summer 2021. Lots of those companies, they kind of pivoted by saying, okay, we're not doing academic tutoring. We're doing cultural education. Um, so we're not teaching them how to handwrite Chinese characters so they can improve their test scores. We teach them how to handwrite beautiful looking calligraphy to make artwork. And in reality, it was still an intensive Chinese character memorizing tutoring center, right? But they called it something different. Um, I know for a fact there were many companies that were doing like competitions where you got coaching as part of the competition that was basically training. Um, there were live-in teacher programs, uh, study tour programs that were still intensive education programs. That's what they were focusing in on, point number three here. Um, and, and it's interesting, of, the commentary on this in the Chinese end is focusing on that as well. A lot of ESL schools, they also made the pivot where instead of teaching ESL, they were teaching an art class. Yes. But the art class was actually an English class. They just kind of disguised that. I know, I know some companies that did this. Um, I'm not sure if you guys saw them, but I saw them. So they, yeah. they, they would get creative in what they were teaching. Like exactly. Like we are an art class or we're learning about traditional stories from around the world. It just so happens we're reading them in English, um, <laughs> this kind of stuff. So that's what they're trying to crack down on here. It's people hiding tutoring under the guise of something else. Um, but it is important to note they have mentioned specifically instant messaging, online conferencing, live broadcast platforms, etc. Um, and it's paid. If you're not just if it's free, don't, they don't care at all. There's plenty of not-for-profit and voluntary organizations. They don't have issues with that. Um, but obviously, I think most people here are trying to earn money from their teaching rights. So <laughs> paid online teaching through any of these platforms um, is potentially under these regulations. But also remember what I said earlier about the jurisdiction for people. Like it's based on where the teacher is based um, from what we saw earlier. Um, right, I'm going to scroll down to the next part. All right, this is the bit I want to highlight. This is the main part, actually. Sorry, we're taking like over half an hour to get to this bit. But this is the main bit I actually want to point out to teachers. So if you've sort of half tuned out right now, please pay back, pay attention again now, because this is one of the key things I think is really worth highlighting um, that they are starting to emphasize a bit more. It says here, if an online platform operator knows or should know that its users are illegally conducting on online off-campus training through instant messaging, online conferencing, live streaming platforms, etc., but still provides services to them, the provisions of the preceding paragraph applies. And that's the preceding paragraph just tells them that the platform is responsible. Um, so essentially, they're saying if you're teaching on a Chinese uh, teaching platform like Class In, it's the responsibility of Class In to make sure that anyone teaching on Class In is compliant with the regulations. 
Now, this was interesting. We've heard some chat, and I'm not sure what you've heard, Julian, on this as well, but I've had a few teachers saying that they've had rumours within the class in community and then people working for class in contradicting or agreeing with various rumours um, about whether these are actually affecting teachers using class in. But I'm not sure what you've heard. I've I've heard uh, we actually have somebody in the chat talking about class in too mm -hmm. that class in made an, I think was it an official announcement class in sent out a notification today saying that this does not affect them. Um, the thing with class in class in is going to be different than if you're using Zoom or sorry if you're hearing my beeping sorry Cla class in is going to be a little bit different if um, if you're using class in than if you're using like Koala Go or Zoom or you know a lot of the other ones and the reason for that is class in is actually a chinese company it is owned and it is funded by tencent um which is chinese and other chinese investors um so because of that uh if anybody's going to have any um if any platform teaching platform is going to have any implications you would see it on class in first if class in is sending out a notification saying that it doesn't affect them um then you can rest assured it's not going to affect your other classes because it would affect class in more and before it would affect if you're teaching on zoom or if you're teaching on koala or if you're teaching anywhere else um, simply because they are located in beijing i believe and they are like like they, all of their investors are Chinese investors. If this were to affect class in, um, it would it would probably shut them down because I could imagine that the majority of their business is from um, teachers <laughs> because they're class Not in. Not really, actually. So this is something I think is quite interesting about class in. Class in's main audience are universities in China offering online classes for university oh. students around the world or Chinese students. Um, that's why if you look at a lot of the features, they're designed for large scale classes they've got a lot of tools that are useful if you're teaching really large groups like polls and stuff like that um because that was their original market universities doing online classes in fact i took a university program that was an online chinese teacher training program uh, with a university in shanghai during covid um, and because of covid i couldn't go to china to do this teaching program um, and instead it was led online and all of our classes were through class in um, so actually their main market is chinese schools and universities independent teachers is a relatively small. I think they're trying to expand more internationally, but it's a relatively small market. So I think from Classen's point of view, remember what we said before about jurisdiction and like these regulations do not appear to apply for teachers who are related outside of China, who are located outside of China. So if Classen was to try and implement these regulations you know, more thoroughly, they would need to check every single user on their platform, what country are they in, prove what country they're in, um, and then make their assessment against the, these regulations. Also, take a look at the age of the student, because you could be um, teaching online classes within China, which means it falls in, under the jurisdiction of China, but you're teaching business professionals. So it's not kids. These regulations don't apply, that kind of thing. So they would have to go through every single teacher on their platform and try and evaluate these things. Um, so I think there's either two scenarios. Firstly, they either don't bother. Um, and it's interesting that I think the reports people have heard back in class in, some of them are kind of contradicted things, maybe because the person at class in is not aware of whether they're talking to someone who's in China or outside of China. Um, so I think class in would either not do anything or they would ban everyone um, who's not like a registered organization. Because if you're a registered organization in China, you've gone through some approval process, you know, like your university, for example, then these things don't apply. Um, but then they will lose a, a relatively large chunk of their business and expanding part of their business. Um, yeah, or they're going to have to go through some kind of process where they're manually checking everyone. Personally, I don't like class in any way. So my advice is just pick something else. <laughs> like, make sure you have a backup option. If you're teaching with class in or Vuv or Jumu or any of the Chinese platforms, make sure you've got a backup option just in case class in does go down the route, just banning everyone who's not a registered Chinese university. Um, make sure you have a backup plan. I would recommend, personally, I love Koala Go. I love Super Teacher. Um, even Zoom, Zoom has been having some issues. I think that's actually unrelated to these things. Um, Zoom has been having some issues. But make sure you have a backup option, just in case. Zoom, I also has, think been, Zoom has only been having issues for a handful of teachers. It's not yeah. affected, like it hasn't affected any of my Chinese students. Um, that I, I, I teach most of mine on uh, Koala Go, but the ones that I teach on um, Zoom, it has not affected them. And if you ask teachers, um, most of them are going to say none of my students are affected. It's just you're hearing about the ones that are affected because there's nothing to say if everything's fine, but you have something to say if you have a big problem. Yeah. So 
I mean, but I think some right. of it is just patchy internet issues. Um, sometimes things are implemented at a local level, not at a, a national level. So they're affecting only certain cities in China. But I have heard increasing reports of people, even with Zoom Pro, having problems. Um, exactly why that is, it's not clear. And this happened? Zoom, Zoom said they had issues. Like they officially announced that, yes, they'd had issues in China. And this happens probably every like six months. This yeah. happens. Something like this happens with Zoom in China. This is not like it's just something that, that Zoom has to update their technical requirements or change things so that they're, you know, so that they work in certain areas, um, change their server, update their server. It happens probably about every six months. And when it happens, you hear something like this from teachers like yeah. it's happening again. It's happening again. This it, it, and it hasn't happened again. So this is not um, an indication that uh, Zoom's going to be shut down in China. It's just a tech issue. Yeah, I think also with Zoom, it's be aware it's such a big platform for businesses doing online meetings and stuff. I don't think they'd ever be able to completely shut it down anyway. Um, but there were restrictions put in place. For example, I think it's now no longer possible for Chinese users to register accounts to host meetings within mainland China or something. That came about actually before the new education regulations. It was completely unrelated to online teaching, actually. It was there was a someone did some online meeting about it was some campaign that the government didn't agree with and they did it on Zoom and people from China were able to join that meeting. Something like that. And the government didn't like it. Anyway, there was some weird situation happened, nothing to do with online teaching that resulted in there was Zoom being inaccessible for about a month. And then after that there were restrictions on Chinese users registering accounts. But you know, they adapt, there's things that change. If you want to avoid any issues, just go for a while ago, super teacher. Um, and there's a plenty of platforms out there. But yeah, sorry, I interrupted. What were you saying, Gillian? Oh no, there was also something. Um, there was also something back uh, maybe like six nine months ago, where our the United States federal government mm -hmm. um, had a problem with Zoom. Um, spy, or I'm sorry, with China, Chinese spies, um, this sounds like, it sounds like something out of a movie, but with Chinese spies coming and spying on Zoom calls um, for whatever reasons, and you can go and look that up on your own time, but um, I, when things like that happen on a big scale, then they have to make changes. And like down the line when they make changes, like maybe, they, I don't know what happened, but it's possible that they made changes to Zoom's firewall so that this couldn't happen with Chinese agents. And in the process of doing that, there may be some glitches that they have to fix and work out. So there, there could be more to it. Um, at the end of the day, there are other options aside from Zoom anyways. Exactly. Yeah, there's plenty of other options. And I think if you want to avoid issues with Zoom or with any of the Chinese platforms, have a backup option that is not one of those, like Super Teacher, like Qualago. I know those work fine. Um, so pick another option. Um, I'd also say as well, it's interesting here that they're, the, they're holding the platforms responsible. So they're saying here they're not planning on going after individual teachers. They're going to go after the platforms that are facilitating the online classes. Um, and this comes down to, you know, again, as we already mentioned, the regulations aren't even targeting overseas teachers anyway. But imagine you're an online teacher based within China and you're using class in or something. Um, it's very difficult for the Chinese government to go after one individual teacher. It's much easier for them to just find class in and then class in, it's class in's responsibility to decide whether or not to ban those teachers and like to actually get on with it. Um, it's, so they're putting the onus on the platforms to take that responsibility to sort of check whether people are following the regulations. Um, so that's, I think, important to be aware. And that could result in platforms, like I say, just completely cutting off teachers who don't have a Chinese business registration or something. They want to keep things simple, but then they're going to lose a chunk of their business or they might just choose not to even worry about it. Or they're going to do things on an individual level, checking, um, asking. I heard someone mention they were asked for like a passport or um, ID of some kind. I think so that's from one teaching platform. They might do things on an individual level to see um, which teachers are complying with the regulations and who isn't. Um, okay, we've learned a lot enough about teaching platforms, I think. The other thing, just on the same point, it mentions instant messaging. It's not just talking about the actual live teaching platform itself. It's also talking about any platform that facilitates the online, the lessons. Um, so that would include, for example, WeChat, if you're using WeChat for the communications with your students. Um, I'm not saying that WeChat's going to do a crackdown anytime soon. There are millions of people around the world using WeChat, okay, and they don't read every message you send. That's not what they do. Um, but in theory, WeChat might be held liable if they are found to be facilitating online teaching, again, under the 
what we said previously about this applying primarily to organizations and individuals within China anyway. Which basically means if you've got a Zoom, if you've got not Zoom, <laughs> we forget the teaching platforms, if you've got a WeChat account and using that for your main method of communication with students, I would just really recommend having a backup option. Like still use WeChat for your day to day messages, that's no problem. But have email addresses of all your students just in case there's an issue, because then you can message them and say, WeChat's done something strange and everyone's accounts got blocked. Let's message on some other platform or let's communicate by email. So have a backup communication method as well. And also, like, I don't know what your opinions are on those WeChat groups, Gillian, but like, I always recommend teachers avoid those like teacher student connection WeChat groups, which are full of like 500 teachers, one parent who's looking for free trial classes. And I don't think teachers have success with those anyway. Um, certainly not if you're trying to target a high value niche, like they're full of people fishing for free trials. But I think there is a risk of being reported or like being flagged up as spam. Um, and that could cause issues. I would never recommend doing that anyways. Um, when you go into those, the, those groups, they become oversaturated with, uh, here, here's like a quick marketing tip for you guys. This isn't any, this isn't relative to what we're talking about, but this is a really good marketing tip for you. So go away, take this and, and, and leave with this information here. Um, when you start and you, you start marketing on WeChat, what ends up happening if you get into these groups that are like parent teacher connection or old whales teachers or anything like that? Yeah. Um, you've got maybe 25% of it are teachers, or I'm sorry, 25% of it are parents and 75% are teachers. And what ends up happening is 75% of teachers are posting in there and spamming in there and whatever. The 25% of the parents go in there and they're basically window shopping. They're looking for the most acceptable teacher to teach the most, um, the most acceptable teacher at the cheapest price. You exactly. don't want to put yourself in that group. Get out of there. That's not where you want to be. You don't want to be competing with teachers that are willing, that are desperate and willing to go down to $5 an hour. Learn how to market your services without depending on somebody else's WeChat group. Grow your own WeChat group and kick all the other teachers out of there, you know, and that way it's you and 500 potential students, 500 or 400. I think it's five. I think the limit's 500 in WeChat groups. Yeah. yeah. So that becomes you and then 499 potential students in one group. And then you join another group or you create another group. And, you know, it's the same thing. Like get out of somebody else's group and stop that because the people that are there are looking for cheap things. And then the other thing, when you start marketing yourself to people that are not willing to spend a lot of money, they do not value you as a teacher. And this, and I actually just made a short on this on my YouTube channel. So you're going to see this come out, I think on Thursday, because I scheduled it. But what ends up happening is that the teachers are going to say things or the parents are going to say things like, um, I want you to teach Starlight curriculum. Um, and then you're over there and you're spending all your time trying to find Starlight curriculum. And this is where you yep. see this, like who has access to National Geographic or who has access to this? Or they'll say, well, I want you to, can you do 25 pack, 25, a package of 25 and give me a price of this? And can you make your own slides for this? And can you do this? And can you do a test? And can you, you know, stop. Because at the end of the day, this is your business. You need to be respected as a professional. I coach teachers. I coach teachers to how to do this. So that's that's something I actually run an entire academy called Independent Teacher Academy. Do you think that if you came to me and said, okay, I want you to teach me how to market my online classes, but can you use this curriculum to teach me? No, get out of here. That's the attitude that you need to have. Get out of here. You are not telling me how to run my business. I am the expert. You're coming to me for help. Trust me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Obviously don't say that, but that's the yeah. attitude you need to internalize. And that's and the thing. I think you have to, as you say, we're talking about earlier about learning the marketing strategy you need to be successful. If you're just jumping in someone else's WeChat group and you're just spamming with an advert, that is not good marketing strategies. It's not building your business up for success in longer term. And as we said, the kind of there's always risk involved on Chinese social media. If you get flagged up, someone reports you on WeChat just for spam, not because it's online teaching, you're just spamming in a group that don't like don't like the annoying messages and they report it. WeChat's AI system, if you get a certain number of reports, will just block your account because you got reported too much. Um, nothing to do with these new regulations. It's just WeChat doesn't like spam. Um, so if you want to learn more about social media marketing strategies, whether that's the Chinese market, whether that's outside of China, I've got in the description of the video links to um, Gillian offers Independent Teacher Academy. She's doing some um, 
I should tell you more about this in a minute, but she's doing some strategy calls with teachers who want to learn more about what that's about um, and how to develop your business. I've also got links to the Average Academy courses, which has marketing courses about Xiaohong Shu marketing, WeChat marketing, particularly focusing on the Chinese market. So use these resources. Um, there's also the free Facebook group is in the chat. Use these resources to learn the skills you need to be able to advertise properly um, in order to avoid risks on platforms. And also so you can expand your business beyond just you know that WeChat group that someone added you randomly to that's full of spammers. Um, actually, do you want to tell everyone about your strategy calls, Gillian? Okay, so on the strategy, now I will tell you that I will not accept everybody into a strategy call. I've done that before and I end up working like eight hours a day doing strategy calls for people that are not really looking to grow. They're not looking for the right things. So if you're looking to do a strategy call, these are intended for teachers who are looking to grow their business independently, not with a company and, you know, not looking for like different, like uh, curriculum or anything like that. Like we are here for you on that, but not on the strategy calls on the strategy calls. We're going to dig deep into your independent teaching business or your plans. These are meant for teachers who are looking to scale their income to $4,000 or more teaching online. Um, they're for the go-getters, right? You want like a thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars a week teaching online. This is what we're going to teach you. We're going to talk like we can get into like running group lessons and hosting, you know, starting your own independent teaching company and um, you're doing all of those things. But basically these calls are we'll talk for like 30 to 45 minutes. We'll discuss um, where your individual business should be and we'll create a strategy plan for you. Um, if you apply, I will, I will look through the questions, make sure you answer them. If you apply, um, and you get a message that says, Hey, I'm sorry, I'm canceling this. Just know that that doesn't mean it's nothing against you. Like I still love you, still want to help you. It just means that this call is not right for where you are and what you want to, you know, what you're looking to accomplish in the next 90 days. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. But I think that's a fantastic resource. And I think teachers need to upskill. Like if you are going to be an independent online teacher, um, you need to be taking your business seriously and looking at how you can develop skills you need to grow. Um, so take advantage of these resources that are offering you. The links are in the description. There are the courses. There's a Facebook group. There's strategy calls. Um, I've just got Brenda commenting saying great courses. Thank you, Brenda. Um, really appreciate that. Um, so have a look in the description for that information. Um, let's just go back to what we're looking at. I made notes. I was organized. I made notes and everything, guys. Um, so we're just talking here about the, we've gone through actually all the main points of the regulations. This is the, the last point I had highlighted here. Um, the onus being put on platforms that are facilitating tutoring. Um, but I think, do we want to just sort of summarize a bit? I'm going to close the screen share because it's making us tiny. There we go. <laughs> now we can see it. Okay, we're being tiny. <laughs> I'm like bumming it with Jeep here. Right before I came in, I had to run downtown for something and I didn't want to put gas in my car. So I took my boyfriend's Jeep, which doesn't have the top on. I'm like sitting there like it's going to rain my Jeep hair. So I'm like, you can keep me little. No. Yeah. But it's nice to actually see people too. So here we are. <laughs> um, uh, my oh, awful. Don't admire the spots in my head. At the, right. end of the um, day, at the end of the day, what it comes down to is, is this going to affect you? Probably right. not. Um, do Katie and I know everything and are we always right? No, it could affect you. Should you be prepared for, you know, running your own businesses? Absolutely. Whether or not this, you know, whether or not this is going to affect you, you should definitely take it into your own hands. If you're doing this as a side job and this is like, okay, like I just teach like a couple hours a week and I'm not really looking, I'm not like, this is just extra income and I don't really care about it. It's just something I do for fun. Then don't learn marketing skills. But if you're like, hey, this is my business, this is my livelihood, then you need to be treating it like your livelihood. Treat it like a business owner and be serious about it. Learn the strategies to grow your own independent business. You do not want to keep this in the hands. Like, look at all those teachers that were making like $10,000 a month on VIP Kid, okay? Yeah. And then overnight, it's like, boom, all of their classes 
were gone. Nobody thought this was going to affect VIP Kid. VIP Kid is still in existence. I called that, by the way. It happened exactly as I called it. I said, VIP Kid is not going to go out of business, but it's going to affect you. And now you have people that are teaching VIP Kid Global, and they've gone two years with no classes or limited classes. Just now we're hearing that their classes are starting to increase. And VIP Kid knows how to market. They know how to market their classes. But they had to make a huge pivot because they were no longer marketing in the Chinese marketplace. They had, you know, they had to be like, okay, well, we got to take it somewhere else. So at the end of the day, this comes down to taking it into your own hands. You can be with the most successful company, which right now that would probably be out school, right? You mm -hmm. could be with out school. And uh, even out school is having some rocky moments the last few years. Out, out school. Out school is not teaching, treating their teachers right at the moment. Um, they've made some changes and policies that I do not agree with um, that are very selfish and um, not really for the teachers personally, but they're still doing great and you could still get a lot of students with them. But at the end of the day, uh, anything could happen. Investors could pull out. Um, go the government could make changes. You know, at the end of the day, you are safe if you learn how to run your own business and don't rely on another company. It's same thing with like these, what did you call them? They're, they're like the, the little oh, like the micro, micro agents. I, yeah. I kind of coined this term to refer to those people who are either moms or like maybe they used to work for a cram school or something in China and they claim they'll you know link you up with students um, on WeChat or something and they'll kind of organize it from their end. And they're just like a random person. Sometimes they don't have zero knowledge at all of the online education industry or like they're just a mom and they don't understand simple policies you might have for example cancellation policies they haven't bothered to kind of liaise with the student to to put those policies in place because they didn't think of that because they're not from the same industry um there's so many issues with these micro agents some of them have had issues with them running away with parents money assigning teachers saying students sorry to one teacher and then just taking away from that tutor and assigning to someone else because they're paying them more money like as, as Gillian says, you want to be responsible for your business. Learn strategies you need to be successful with your business and take, you know, take control of your own hands. If it's a side hobby for you, fine. That's totally fine to have it as a side income, a little bit extra on the side alongside your classroom teaching or alongside being a full-time mom or whatever else is you, you do. Like, fair enough. But if you want your business to grow, you have to develop the skills yourself. Okay, I feel like I'm rambling. Should I briefly summarize? Um, yeah, yeah, and then we'll just have a look at a few of the questions that popped up. Um, so those are some of the key things from what we looked at with those regulations and what we've been talking about. Overall, there is no huge change, okay? Please do not go out and panic. Um, there are no massive changes here that are different to what we saw in the original 2021 regulations and some of the clarifications that have been issued since. They're just clarifying the regulations. They're trying to put in place procedures for who's responsible for various things, um, so admin type stuff. But the actual regulations themselves, no major change. They're still focusing very much on in-person programs within China. And there's mention of online programs taught by teachers within China. The focus is very much like on stuff happening in China and those in-person programs, those cram schools. They're not focusing on online teachers located outside of China. In fact, the regulations make no mention of that scenario. Um, so they're not trying to crack down on online teaching. Don't panic. As we mentioned, there's a few key things I'd recommend doing just generally, like have a non-Chinese -te teaching platform as a backup. Uh, have a backup communication method in case WeChat has issues because the way in which the platforms might decide to implement the regulations, even if they don't actually apply to you, might just be a block ban or something because it makes it easier for them to enforce regulations. So have backup options. Um, avoid these risky scenarios. Avoid the micro agents, these big open WeChat groups. And as Gillian says, diversify your business. Reach students in other markets. You know, the, the marketing skills you've learned for advertising in China, that I teach with my coaching, that Gillian's taught with her coaching, you might have done from the Average Academy courses. These strategies, they apply to other markets too, right? The same concept. Just take it from Xiaoxu and apply it to Instagram. And okay, there's a few small technical differences, algorithms slightly different, but the broad concepts are the same. And the strategy you're learning will help you expand elsewhere. If you're still wanting to focus on the Chinese market, um, you know, that's that's fine. You can still have a lot of success with the Chinese market. Don't panic. Um, you can also consider targeting a broader range of learners, like adult learners, for example, specifically excluded in these regulations. So then there's definitely no issues at all at any point in the future. Um, and also look into overseas Chinese populations. I had teachers contact me saying that the reason they're worried about advertising on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or LinkedIn or whatever is because they've made all of their marketing materials in Chinese um, or they put like dual language subtitles on their videos or something. And it's a right pain to go back and remake them again with Spanish subtitles to target learners in Spain or whatever. Um, 
but actually, firstly, if you're using, you know, depending on what editing tools you're using, you can just change the language in one click quite often. Um, but also there are expat families, like Chinese families all around the world. And actually many of the students that I've taught were Chinese expats living in Japan, Chinese expats living in Hong Kong. Um, they're still speaking Chinese. I would message the parents in Chinese, but their native language is Chinese. So they're going to be paying attention to Chinese social media and like your messaging in Chinese, but they're completely outside of mainland China. So no risk of being shut down or whatever platform you're talking to them. And a note to that. I actually, uh, when I went independent, I wanted, I, I do a lot of marketing research. I'm not just pulling things out of, you know, out of the air here. When I tell you what to do, it's because I've done the market research for it. Yeah. People in China do not want to hear you speak Chinese or see you write Chinese if you don't speak Chinese. Have you ever had somebody like f from a different country that doesn't speak English fluently and they start writing to you and you're like scammer, spammer. I'm not, uh, th that's how they feel about us too. So if you don't speak Chinese fluently, don't use Google Translate to do things. Like when I do my I email marketing, that, yeah. I was gonna say like when I do my email marketing to China or, you know, in my emails at the end of the emails, I will put it in Chinese and then say, this was translated by Google Translate or this was translated by software so that they know like I'm not speaking. But if you're doing reels, if or, like, shorts, I don't know what you call it on Xiaohong Shu, but you know, you're doing like short videos or something like that. And you put subtitles on there, um, make them really simple and not full sentences anyways. And, and I would just not, I would put them in English, you know, the they reason can I always disagree with this. Sorry, <laughs> sorry to butt in. The reason I disagree with this is to do with algorithms. If you write your post in English, then the algorithm will scan the keywords in your post, which will be in English and then show your post to people who are searching for those keywords in English, which is most likely other English speaking people. This is the case on Xiaohongshu. Different social media platforms, different rules, like research how the platform works. On Xiaohongshu, if you write your post in Chinese, the algorithm will pick up on the terms in Chinese, your Chinese hashtags, your title, the keywords you've used throughout in Chinese, and they'll show up in Chinese search results. Whereas if you write it in English, it's only really going to reach an English speaking audience. But having said that, like Julian says, you can still add a note on it saying this was translated by a translation tool you know, if you want to make that clear. For me as well, like I found when I put things on social media, just for reference, I've been learning Chinese. I had Chinese classes when I was in secondary school. I went to China for a year at intensive classes for a full year, 20 hours a week of classes at a university. I took online classes. I told, mentioned before I did a, a one semester Chinese teacher training program. Like I feel like my Chinese is relatively good, okay? Not, it's not fluent. Um, that article we looked at earlier, that was like legal Chinese beyond my level. But you know, everyday conversations, messaging on WeChat, writing things on Xiaohongshu, not a problem. Um, I might make the occasional grammar error, but people forgive that, right? Um, so in that case, I'm quite confident writing things in Chinese. And I almost, I like to talk about how by learning another language has opened up different opportunities. You can almost use that as a marketing strategy in itself, talking about your own Chinese learning experiences and therefore how you can help students learn English because you learn a foreign language yourself and you understand those linguistic differences. Um, but, you know, if you're concerned about the way your posts are being received, if you've used a translation tool, like Julian says, just put on it, this was translated. Email marketing is different because email marketing is not relying on algorithms. So um, I just want to, when you're, when you're making your videos, I wouldn't put the subtitles in Chinese. They can, they can read the, you know. That's why I disagree. Cause I think having the subtitles in Chinese on the video makes it really helpful for them to understand. Like I wouldn't try and speak Chinese. If you, if you can't speak Chinese, don't try and like read it out Not yourself. full sentences, not full sentences. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say. Not full sentences. Like if you want to do like a word, like vocabulary and word, but see, you speak Chinese. Other people don't speak Chinese. And if That's I actually, thing. if I yeah. use a translation tool to make the subtitles, I'm being a bit lazy, right? So I use right, right now we're live streaming from Wave Video. I use Wave Video for editing my videos for posting on Xiaohongshu as well. So we really got a really great option to add subtitles and with one click to turn them into Chinese and add bilingual subtitles. But I do check them because like I can read Chinese, so I look at it and I'm like that's not quite what I want to say or it sometimes they will translate a word directly. Like for example, I saw a teacher made some flashcards recently. They put them on Xiaohongshu and it had the word cycle, like to cycle a bike, like ride a bike to cycle. But it, it translated as to cycle as in something going round in a circle, like in the washing machine. So it was like the cycling you use for talking about a laundry machine, not the cycling for <laughs> riding a bike. So like sometimes if you do individual words, it doesn't translate properly. Um, but yeah, we're kind of going off the topic actually of what we're trying to talk about today with the regulations here. but. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's many different opinions on using. And I will tell you, I will tell you. Then it, when when it there is no, 
there is, there's not just one way to do things. And I will tell you that Katie and I do have different opinions and different experiences of things. I think you're frozen. Are you frozen? Okay. Sorry, Katie and I, <laughs> I do have different um, methods and different opinions when it comes to marketing. Uh, she doesn't touch email. Um, I do email marketing with my students and it works. Um, I, I don't, I don't touch little red book. I use WeChat and email. She, you know, she does a uh, little red book and uh, WeChat doesn't touch email and we do have different opinions. So, you know, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Should we jump into some of the questions? Cause I feel like we've gone off talking, talking about everything, which is very interesting, but I'm just <laughs> started a bunch of questions here on way video for us yes. to pick up on some of these I've actually answered. We went through these. So I'm just going to remove them. Um, someone asked, where's it gone? I saw it. I saw it. Someone was asking about, um, where's it gone? Does your course have tags for teachers, Katie? Are you talking about hashtags, Brenda? Oh yes, this question. Oh, I think, I think I know what this might be about. So someone messaged me before about this as well. Like in my training course, like I have a course all about marketing on Xiaomushul. There's a free Xiaomushul bootcamp, which you can find the links underneath the video. Um, it's under the Abridge Academy courses, and then that leads into like a big mega course about mastering Xiaohongshu. In those courses, I talk to you about how to use hashtags. Um, some ways, don't worry too much about hashtags, because actually it treats them the same as other keywords, mostly. Um, and I don't give specific tags because you don't want to be using generic hashtags anyway. Um, I show you how to research hashtags. Um, how to find the right relevant niche hashtags for what you're posting about. But if you're using a hashtag like English teacher, it's that's not going to help us presenting you as a general ESL teacher who charges ten dollars an hour. That's not going to help you reach higher paying students. So, and I can't provide a summary of the hashtags for high niche students because it depends on your niche, right? What I use for teaching science students very different to what you might be using for teaching like business professionals in the fashion industry. Like so completely Katie, different hashtags. Katie's course provides a hashtag strategy, which yes. is going to be much more valuable than a list of hashtags that everybody can use, especially because those will change all the time anyways, yes. even if she did go through and, and yeah. So yeah, absolutely. And like with some of the teachers I've done coaching with, if you, if you book one-on-one -on -one coaching with me, I do work with teachers to implement that strategy, you know, do the research with you. We find the hashtags that are doing well. I show you how to find ones for each specific post. You don't want to use the same hashtags on every post and we work together on that. But yeah, if you're signing up for the course, it's a very affordable course, um, but because it's very affordable, it's, you know, generic. So I'm teaching the strategies you need to, to be able to research the hashtags that you will have most success with. Wave. She uses Wave to edit her videos, which is new to me because that. I've never used that before. That's what we're on right Ooh, now. Wave video is awesome. Should I put this in? I will put my, I have a referral link. Let me send you my referral link, guys. Um, so Wave video is what we're using right now. So if you like the design of whatever you see on the screen right now, um, this is Wave video. And it's it's really useful because it's size as a live streaming platform. So as you see, we're live streaming this live right now. Um, but it also has a whole bunch of other features like editing. So when you want to record a video talking about, um, I don't know, what could you be talking about? Something to do with your teaching, right? So my specialism is science classes. So maybe I'm doing a video I want to talk about the difference between entropy and enthalpy. This is like A-level chemistry, high school chemistry, something or other. Um, then I might want to record basically the materials I would use in my teaching to show that perhaps. I wouldn't recommend doing this all the time, but maybe I'm doing like a demo of my class materials basically. You can do that within the Wave live streaming studio, like it's a live stream, but you just record it instead. And then within the Wave video, you can edit it and you can add subtitles and you do all these kind of cool stuff to it, add animations, chop bits out that you stumbled over, that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, you get, it does bilingual subtitles in English, Chinese, a whole bunch of other languages. It's really good, I recommend. Brenda said we need lifetime access to what? To what? Tell me what. <laughs> lifetime access to the courses that's referring to. We talk about courses in Brenda earlier. If you buy the courses, the courses do come with lifetime access, the Age Academy courses anyway. Um, Independent I Teacher think. Academy currently does too. That may change in the future because it is currently underpriced, with, especially for lifetime access and coaching and the training videos. And Independent Teacher Academy just came out with a 2.0 version, which is meant to not just educate you, but to actually give you a strategy to implement right away and start getting students. But yes, lifetime access for both of our stuff. Awesome. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of lifetime access to things. It means you have I think it's important to give people a deadline to actually implement stuff, but it also means you can go back to it in the future. 
a lot mm -hmm. of stuff in my courses, for example, are tutorials on like how to do various things. And maybe you haven't got to the point of editing advanced videos yet. But then in a few months time, you want to review that section of the course about that and you'll go back and see the tools. In life, yeah. things can happen too. So it, it, it would be terrible to go into a coaching program and then, you know, you get hit by a car and you're in the hospital and you can't implement it. And then you come out and you're like, oh, well, okay, now I have to buy it again. I, I just, I yeah. like lifetime. Yeah, I like lifetime. Exactly. Okay, um, Brenda's just clarified to Wave Video. Wave Video yeah. used to do Lifetime. Um, so I'm using my Wave Video account right now. I bought a Lifetime access to Wave Video. It was very cheap. I got a good bargain because I bought it really early when it wasn't so good. Now it's much better. They no longer offer the Lifetime deal. That was like an early people only deal. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I don't, maybe they do in the future. I don't run Wave Video. No idea. But um, <laughs> at the moment, it's a monthly subscription. They have a free like a free-ish version and then you pay for upgraded things groove is supposed to come out with <laughs> eventually they're supposed to come out with something that is to replace like streamlard and what is stream stream oh, yeah. streamyard and wave whether or not i mean right now they're focusing on ai products so i don't know when that's going to come out but yeah there's a few other software tools and things i've used in the past that suddenly that the entire focus on ai and right now i'm like i'm so sick of hearing about ai i'm gonna be honest oh no i love I ai i know jillian i know everyone's loving I ai but like how to uh, use it. i have to teach it you are going to love it when you learn how to use it because it, i've tried oh. i'm not convinced <laughs> <laughs> also it's interesting because going back to social media marketing um i did a video a while back about using ai to generate a post on xiaohongshu and the content it came up with decent not perfect but it was fine um after i posted that suddenly my post reach plummeted um i'm not sure that's complete coincidence but i do suspect that they're scanning for ai the like ai has been a lot more successful in china for a lot longer than it's been known in like the uk or the us um so i have a feeling some of the chinese platforms already don't like ai content like they're they're not to spread rumors like but, you yeah. okay so you, like you took the words from the is that what you mean like you took yeah i tried okay. to do a little thing okay. demonstrating how a teacher could use chat gpt to make a post for xiao Shu. Um, so here's a quick tip when yeah. you're using ai tell it as much information as you possibly can okay so as much of like tell like i am a teacher that does this 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 and the third and i want my post to convey this and blah 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 tell it everything that you can when it comes out it's going to be very robotic tell it make it sound more personal um like formal but uh still personal uh, professional but informal something like that and less robotic it's going to give you another version of it and then you're going to go through and you're still going to tweak it because you don't want to sound like a robot yeah, no, I agree with that. And I think the difficulty for teachers is if they're doing that in a foreign language and they don't, they don't know yeah. the language. That's, that's where the challenge comes about. Um, but I've included that using AI generated content directly for posting things in Chinese, not necessarily a good idea. Um, I, I don't know. I like to write off myself. I'm too traditional. Anyway, um, we've got a few more questions here that I just want to pick up on because we are already massively over time. Um, mystery facebook user um by the way there's a link underneath the video for you to authorize wave video to access your name in the future um the question is what about alipay for payments facilitating tutoring payments i think this comes back to what we we're talking about before about online platforms potentially being held liable that is potentially the case what would you say julian um i would say that i don't even use chinese payment processors anymore because i, I like they they can use paypal they can use stripe um sometimes it's a, a jump to do it like sometimes it's a hurdle for them but if they if you market yourself to the point where they're like okay i need this teacher they're gonna do it they have access to credit cards and debit cards and all of that they just don't usually use them they connect them to wechat and they forget about them but they still have them yeah. when it comes down to it i don't i've never used alipay um, and I don't use WeChat Pay anymore because what happens is and this, I'm going to give you a little snippet here that I do in my coaching and I do in my independent teacher uh, academy program here. When you are teaching and you're using WeChat, WeChat does not give you the option to do a subscription. I prefer subscription classes because mm -hmm. if you teach in a package, you're like, okay, here's a package. It's $20 an hour. Here's a package of 10. They have to give you $200 in another 10 weeks or five weeks. If you're teaching, you know, if you're teaching two classes a week, so another five to 10 weeks, they have to give you another $200. Generally speaking for larger packages, you're going to cut your rates down too. So maybe you're getting like 175, $190 every 10 weeks. Put yourself in the parent's position. You have to pay $200 in 10 weeks. Right now that might be okay, but in 10 weeks, maybe your car broke down and you had to do something. Now you can't afford it. When you're teaching subscription, 
you don't have to worry about that. But when you're selling in packages, now you have to worry about every 10 weeks, you have to yeah. worry about converting that into another sale. You shouldn't be focusing on reselling to clients that you already have. You should be focusing on new client acquisition. So I can't talk about Alipay because I don't use them and I don't recommend them. Yeah. Stripe and I think yeah. Both WeChat Pay and Alipay don't allow subscription payments if you're using Stripe. They do if you're using a native, they have, if, if you're a Chinese company and you, as a Chinese company, you open a WeChat Pay account or an Alipay account as a company registered in China, different system, and they can do recurring payments. So for example, there's some apps I subscribe to on my phone that are Chinese apps and I pay for them through my WeChat Pay account because I lived in China before I got WeChat Pay. Um, and that's on a subscription basis. So it randomly I get $20 disappears. I'm like, where'd that go? Um, but the the idea is that, like you say, with the subscription payments, the advantage of the subscription payment is that you don't have to think about it. The parent doesn't have to think about it. It's all automated. I still like being able to offer WeChat Pay and Alipay, though. So personally, I prefer, like on Stripe, you've got the invoicing where you've got the payment links off. The payment links is, I think, a bit easier, actually, than doing invoicing. Um, and those support WeChat Pay and Alipay. Again, different teachers, different strategies, different approaches. Um, like I said, yeah. Katie and I do not always... We don't always agree on everything, yep. But to me, it's just not worth it to have to go and invoice a student. And then you like I teach group lessons. I don't teach one on one. I, mean, I have a couple of one on one students, but for the most part, I've got group lessons. So if I have a group of eight students and they're all buying different packages, then I have to keep track of that. Like I have ADHD. I have six kids I have to take care of. I have goats and donkeys in my backyard. I got a lot of things going on aside from teaching. I do not have time to keep track of 400 students who are all have packages that different lengths and I know there's ways to do it, but like, yeah. that's just too much for me. So for my peace of mind and my sanity, it's just so much, the computer does it. I don't have to worry about it. Boom, the computer mm -hmm. does it. And if, if they miss a payment and they, you know, you know, then I get notified in my email, like, hey, this card was declined. Um, and then I know, okay, that student needs to be reached out to. And then I worry about it. Or if a, a parent- And with comes, Stripe, at least, if cards get declined, it tells you, like, what, are you Stripe at Abridge Academy? If anyone here is using the Abridge Academy curriculum, which by the way, amazing, it's wonderful, we'll sign up for it. We've got some new debating lessons for advanced kids, it's wonderful. Anyway, um, if you pay for your Abridge Academy curriculum, um, there's a free version, you can try it out. Um, the I get a message from Stripe, you know, whenever there's a payment issue, because it's a recurring subscription payment, right? Most people are paying with a credit card. They can also pay with PayPal. But regardless of what method they use, if there's an issue with a payment, I get sent an email saying there was an issue with this payment. I log into Stripe. It tells me this was because they didn't have enough money on their card. So then I can reach out to them and be like, oh, I noticed your subscription payment failed because you didn't have enough money on your card. Um, do you want to just double check everything's okay? Sometimes it's because they lost their credit card or someone stole it and they had to report it missing. So the bank has canceled the card and all payments, in which case Stripe tells me. So it's useful to know what the situation is with the recurring payments like that. Um, but yeah, we're kind of going off topic a little bit, but coming back to the question about what about Alipay? Is this affected by the regulations? <laughs> they are responsible as a platform that's facilitating online teaching. If you are under the jurisdiction of China, as we talked about earlier in this webinar about it mostly affecting organizations in China and targeting teachers located in China. Um, if you've just tuned in to us, by the way, zip back to the beginning of this webinar. We talked about loads of stuff. We're already an hour and 20 minutes in. So <laughs> you've missed some key bits earlier on. Um, I will try and go back, actually, if you're watching on my channel, uh, I'll put chapters in for some of the key points because no one's going to rewatch this otherwise. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, any last questions? We're going to have to wrap things up soon because it's getting late here. Uh, okay, we've got a question here from Ogre. Interesting choice of name, Ogre. Um, Anyway, every um, country. <laughs> every country, yes. Other Except than the Chinese market, what other nations of elementary level for students that pay well for learning science or English? I mean, I'm in the UK and parents here are looking for science and English classes. Like, the, the entire world, except you know, there's a few countries like Russia right now and North Korea we talked about as being examples of countries that are not accessible. But the vast majority of the world that is accessible to online teachers they all have elementary school kids unless there's something really wrong with their country and there's no kids left. They all want to have classes. <laughs> there's, there's plenty which of country, out Which country there. doesn't have any kids in it? Oh, I don't know. Uh, well, that, that, I'm not going to get into that. A big issue with an aging society in Japan where I was living. Um, I was just going to get into Japan. Japan. I was like, you know what? That's, that's a rabbit hole. Let's not go there. <laughs> A lot of complicated things. A lot of old people in Japan. Um, although, to be honest, I think that's partly because their healthcare system is really good. Um, but yes, other than Chinese market. The no, world, the, world the Japan, 
Japan actually has a an issue where they don't want the people in Japan don't want to have kids. So there's a huge gap here, and they're actually worried about who's going to take care of their um of uh, there is here's a rabbit hole. They're actually worried about who's going to take care of their um uh elderly population in a couple of years because there's like a 20 year age gap wow. where there's not going to be a workforce. So now they're talking about opening up their borders to allowing immigrants to come in, which is very interesting. Okay, well, it's, it's probably Sorry. the only <laughs> someone who immigrated to Japan and lived there for a year and a half. Well, uh, they're yeah. This is something talk. this is something the government is really talking about in Japan because um, they have a couple of you know they have some immigrant immigrants there, but um, they have not opened up their borders more so um, because they're you know they they're Japan right like it's 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 not like you come to America or you go to the UK and like everybody looks different it's it's Japan you know yeah. and um, there's a there's a big controversy there but the big thing in Japan is that they don't have that that young population it's a it's a you know, people are moving out. People are not having kids. The same thing's actually happening in China, but on a on a smaller scale. Um, yeah. But yeah, they're yeah. Whole of the rabbit hole of issues. <laughs> but yeah. Back <laughs> to the question about other markets, the world is your oyster. There's so many. There's students everywhere. Every country in the world has got kids who are looking for classes. Could be English. It could be science. I think that person mentioned science like subjects. You don't just have to teach academic subjects. I know people have success teaching yoga classes. Like think about your hobbies. Think about your broader skills. Think about other things you might want to offer to diversify your business. So many things. Uh, there's there. a teacher. There's a teacher that is in our academy in ITA, and um, he's a religious teacher. He teaches uh, like Bible study kind of stuff. You know. Don't do that in China. But yeah, very like <laughs> there's a whole range of different things you can do. Um, any country around the world, almost. Um, so keep an open mind as to what the options are. There's a question here from Julie. Are there any penalties for students or parents participating in unapproved learning and teaching activities in China? Um, I recommend watching through the video. And actually, I'm going to, there's a link for the, let me just put it in the chat as well, the link for the actual regulations. Um, the Ministry of Education in China has not got an SSL certificate on their website, so it's not encrypted, and therefore your website, will, your web browser will pop up with a warning when you click on this link saying, warning, this site is not secure, do you trust it? It's the official government website in China, you can trust it, it's just they don't know how to use the internet. Um, so I just I've put the link there for the actual regulations. You probably deactivated it. If you've, if you've done enough work with China, like I've long <laughs> deactivated that warning off my computer. Okay. <laughs> it's so annoying. Um, but anyway, if you get a warning, don't worry about it, it's, this is the government website. So I just put the link in the in the chat. And this is the official regulations. Have a read through. So penalties for students or parents, there is no mention at all in these regulations of student or parent. Like just do a search for the word student or parent. There's no mention of any penalties for students or parents in these regulations. Um, obviously, as we said earlier, we're not legal experts. It's your responsibility to check the regulations and blah, blah, blah. Um, don't sue. But yeah, no need to worry about those. Uh, was there anything else that you saw, Gillian, in the chat that we have missed? Mm, I don't think so. If we did miss it, uh, comment really quick here. Comment um, super quick or just message yeah. on the video later and we'll come back to you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Oh, do I need to make sure I only teach Chinese people, uh, Chinese children up to 9 p.m.? That was, that People have been teaching Chinese kids after 9 p.m. Um, and you've been, they've been fine. Like nothing's going to change with that. Um, I, I would recommend to only do that on weekends though, because you know what, like there's, they're still kids, right? Like if they're going to just think about yourself as a parent, like I don't want my kids up until 10 o'clock learning a, another language. They need their sleep. They're, you know, so um, do I need to make sure I only teach Chinese children up to 9 PM on weekdays? I would just ethically. Um, yeah. but you're not going to be penalized for it. Exactly. I mean, even some of the Chinese platforms, like I taught on Powerfish before, and they still had kids taking classes up to 9 p.m. I'm not sure how they got around it, but like, they certainly reduced the number of students taking classes that late. But I had one kid, I think he was technically in Hong Kong, but like he was taking classes at 9. Um, I just don't recommend it, like you say. And also the kids, they need to sleep. They're not energetic enough to be able to engage in a class. Let them go to bed at 9. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and also we were talking before about diversifying into other markets. Like nine PM in China is seven PM somewhere else. Like, uh, look at other countries. Nine AM here. <laughs> there we go. Nine AM there. Look at the homeschooling kids in in America who want uh, who want classes. Okay, Julie's just saying thanks. Excellent. Glad that helped. Yeah, I'm noticing the viewing numbers are kind of decreasing now because I think it's getting towards everyone's falling asleep. Um, yeah. Should we wrap things up? Yes. Um, just 
at the end of the day, make sure that you learn marketing strategies. Um, some things for you to do after you get off of this. Make sure that you are in the Facebook group. I'm assuming most of you are. It's it's kind of big. It's under the video. Um, and make sure that you are subscribed to Katie's and my channel because we both go, we're both very active in all three places. Um, make sure you join the WeChat and Xiao Hongshu Chinese Marketing Facebook group. So there's two Facebook groups and two YouTube channels that you should be subscribed to. If you are looking to learn WeChat marketing, get Katie's WeChat marketing course. That's in the subscription box or the description box. I can't talk. And if you are looking to grow your independent business and there's something in this video that you watched and it sparked you, it sparked something inside you, then make sure you get on a strategy call. If you are serious, I only accept serious people for these calls. Um, those are your takeaways. So don't worry and focus on growth. Make Trust connections, me. learn things. 100% agree with that. I'm not going to repeat it. I totally agree with what Gillian was saying. Learn, learn the strategies. Links in the description for everything that Gillian was talking about just there. The links aren't in the description for some reason. You can't find something. Just tag one of us and ask and we'll send it to you. Um, because we're streaming to like three or four different places. So we might miss something. <laughs> cool. Yep. Okay. A few people say thank you. Thank you for tuning in, everyone. Yep. We're going to have to get going as well. So thanks so yeah, much. Yeah, it's like late for you, <laughs> Yeah, I've got a group class in like, well, I've got a group class in like an hour here. It's like 25 people and I haven't pre prepared my curriculum yeah. yet. It's <laughs> getting late here, so I'm going to start thinking about dinner. So yeah. Okay, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Um, really appreciate everyone who tuned in, all your great questions. Um, links in the description for everyone we talked about. And yeah, thank you. See you in another webinar some other time. All right. See you guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.